Well, thanks for having me. I don't think I'm going to use a microphone because most of you are sitting up close enough. Can you hear me in the back if I, I sort of scream a little bit? I'll try not to fall off the stage. Also, I'm glad they set this room to refrigerator temperature. Um, I don't know about you, but I can barely feel my fingers, so that's cool. Um, yeah, I was in D.C. yesterday. I was in Iceland before that and in London. And I don't even know what a day or time it is at the moment. I know she's like, what, Iceland? Yeah, I saw you, don't worry. Um, it's really easy to go London to Iceland to, to the States, that's why. It's really cheap, Iceland air, good food, leg room. You know, you're not as tall as me, so you probably don't have to worry about it, but seriously, it's, it's a problem for tall people. Uh, I think you're probably all here because, you know, eventually you want a job, right? That's sort of the, the commonality here in terms of most of you. Some of you are like, maybe I want a job. This guy's like, yeah, I want a job with a tie. <laughs> Some of you have like the full tie and jacket. He's going to like semi-casual back there. He's got the cuffs rolled up, but it's a perfect tie, so that's appropriate. Um, this is the kind of event where I really hope you get your phones out, your devices. Uh, I'd like you to tweet. I, I think one of the things that's cool about this is when you're talking about digital identity, it's really about participatory stuff, right? You're getting on your device, you're sharing your thoughts, you're sharing your questions, and that's important. Oh, some of you are like, damn, did I leave my phone on? It's okay. You can leave your phone on. The hashtag, by the way, how many of you are on Twitter? How many of you tweet? Nice. She's like, no, you're going to tweet, tweet for her, okay? Okay. This is the kind of event where you get on Twitter, and I don't want you just to be posting about the weather all the time, or like food, or you know, stress, or tests, or just whatever. But you know, it's really useful to think about what you can do with social media for work, because it's all kind of combined, right? It all matters. And so the hashtag for this is just CurrySC. My username on Twitter is at Eric Stoller. What's going to happen with autocorrect, though, is it's going to change my name to Stroller. <laughs> Right? It's highly problematic. Get in my shoes. It's really not good. But if you tweet at me, tweet at Eric Stoller, I'll make sure I see those tweets. If you want to use the hashtag, that's cool. I think there's supposed to be like 100 people here today, and it looks like we got a few less that showed up. There's, I think it was 600 total seniors, is what I was told. So it means the rest of them are slackers, and you all really care about getting a job, right? That's the, the key. Because it's like, why wouldn't you want to be here to learn about career stuff early on? Because how many of you have a little bit of anxiety around the whole job thing? Right? That's totally normal. The rest of you, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, it's, totally, it's totally normal to have anxiety, to have adrenaline and whatnot. I mean, uh, you know, I came from Iowa. I grew up in like literally like cornfields and, and farms. And I've lived in Chicago. I've lived out in Oregon. I live in London now. My whole life and my career has been about transitions and, and just figuring out how to sort of be a professional in lots and lots of different spaces. And social media specifically has helped me do that. Back in 2010, I was invited to write for one of the largest education news sites uh, in the States because I'd been blogging and posting stuff on the web for quite a while, and that was just something I was passionate about, something I was interested in. I mean, the key sort of thing when it comes to your careers is you want to love whatever it is you're doing, right? And hopefully, you're not using technology in a way that's going to hurt you. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go over things that are sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of social media. Um, I've got some tweets from people from Curry College. I know there's some gasps in the room. Like some of you are like, oh man, I hope it's not me. Uh, it might be. I kind of covered up some names though to make it a little bit anonymous. Uh, I blurred out some of the swears. Some of you like to swear a lot. Um, like, oh, I mean, really, there's only 140 characters on Twitter. And some of you, you're like, I'm going to use all of them. With that. I got no periods or any other bits of grammar. Now, I know, it's, it's impressive, really. But I, you know, I, I think back to even you know, my own sort of social media history. I was in graduate school back in 2004 when Facebook came online, and everyone was like, you got to get on Facebook. And that was really old school, and we didn't, we didn't care back then what we posted. You know, I wasn't thinking back in 2004, 2005, that people would see what I'm posting online today in, in 2015, you know? Like, when there's a photo of me wearing a sombrero, and I've got a shot that's the color of the Mexican flag, like three colors, and I'm smiling, and I'm like, you know what, it's my birthday, and I'm of age, why can't I do this? So I didn't think necessarily about the fact that people might be looking at this stuff now, I'm thinking, hold on a minute, 
That's an interesting hat choice that Eric's got there. <laughs> because, you know, the proliferation of social media sites is such that there are so many. I know it's a cat. If you're going to talk about the internet and anything social media related, you have to have cats involved, <laughs> right? I'm talking to you two guys in the plaid back there. That's right. Can we get him some caffeine, man? You I'm jet lagged, like hella jet lagged. <laughs> I need you. There you go. I got him to smile. Okay. <laughs> I don't even want to I woke up at 3.30 a.m. yesterday. My body thought it was 8 o'clock in the morning. That's what happens when you go from the UK to the US. With our social media presence, though, you probably recognize some of these platforms, some of these apps, some of these channels. Uh, when I was being driven in over here to Milton just today, I saw a billboard. I don't even know what road it was on because I was really tired and the driver was talking to me about career stuff. And I was like, I'm going to be talking about this later on, but I'll talk to you now about it. And then I see this billboard. You may have seen it. It's just Snapchat's logo. Like, they just have tons of money, right? They just put up a billboard that's the ghost logo for Snapchat. No context, no details. We're just Snapchat, which is sort of weird because it's a billboard. It's very traditional media. How many of you are using Snapchat? Right? Some of you probably use it instead of texting. Right, because it sort of self-destructs, and then, but your friends take, they take screenshots anyway, right? So they're going to burn some of that, it's going to be calm up. But, and then did you see that Snapchat, you can actually pay to see things more than once now? Yes. Isn't that just evil? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be nice if like, you could bill your friends that were doing that, right? Like you got some of that money yeah. instead, that's, that'd be a good business proposition right there. <laughs> Interestingly though, with Snapchat, that stuff that you share on Snapchat, it's actually stored in their servers for a pretty long amount of time. You know, people talk about things on the web as being ephemeral or things on apps being ephemeral, as in it's gonna disappear. And you know, as you know, if you put it out there on a digital device or an app or a site, even for like a second, someone like me is gonna take a screenshot of it and then he's gonna share it on the big screen. The next thing you know, you're like famous in a way you don't wanna be. What about Yik Yak? Is Yik Yak big at Curry? Mm -hmm. Used to be. Last year. Used to be. So last year. Yeah. You know, I peeked. I did. I peeked on Yik Yak just the other day, actually, at here at Curry. Man, people, it's always like sex, drugs, Netflix. <laughs> it's, it's the same in every city, right? Even in London, it's the same thing. Watch too much Netflix, drink too much tea. You know? That's a, that's a London joke. <laughs> but again, you know, no matter what the platform, you know, if it's Facebook, it sort of used to be the thing, uh, to, to Yik Yak, which apparently was last year, it's making its way slowly through Europe now. Uh, Snapchat, you know, Reddit, any of you on Reddit? Yeah, thank you, nerds. Let's, let's show of hands. Yeah. I love Reddit. I love Reddit. It's kind of like, like real conversations happening on Reddit, sometimes anonymously, sometimes not, but it's a huge community and people sometimes don't think about it, but you know, you could really make a career out of using Reddit. As a journalist in education, I use Reddit to source stories and information. And I always think about, how can I use things like this professionally, right, and personally, because I do the same silly stuff, I share stuff, etc. but I also use it for work. And I think when it comes to social media, that's really important is we have to think about it from the aspect of it's not just personal, it's not just professional, but it's all together. And for some people, that's kind of a nightmare, right? They don't want to have it all together. They don't want to have, you know, the personal stuff shared with the professional stuff. I was on the, the phone yesterday because, you know, sometimes you have to make a call with these things. Very rarely, though, you know, you don't want to have to make it happen. But I was on the phone yesterday with my dad. And he told me, you know, I was talking about social media, he's always wanting to know what it is that I do. And, and then he started referencing Facebook and he said, you know, I been keeping track of what you and your wife are doing and whatever. And I said, but dad, you're not on Facebook. He was like, no, I've been logging in using your mom's account. <laughs> and so I, I tweeted this out, I said, my dad told me that he checks Facebook using my mom's account. Asked him why he doesn't get his own. I don't like, like technology. I'm like, oh, thanks, Dad. That's pretty ironic, given you know, that you're, you're creeping. Like, my dad's like the old, like ultra lurker on Facebook. <laughs> someday, maybe someday. My dad's almost 65. Maybe I'll get him on social media for work. We'll see. And so, 
I know you're going to be getting lots of sort of like practical ideas and lots of tips today through the workout workshops and breakout sessions, but I don't do a lot of bulleted lists because honestly I think they're really boring and you probably get a lot of PowerPoints and bulleted lists and let's be honest, they're, they're not so exciting. This is the only one I've got, I promise. When it comes to thinking about your digital identity and thinking about what it is you're posting, thinking about what it is that you've posted in the past, it's important to sort of think about these aspects. One, be unique. There's nothing worse than being boring. You know, one of the things that I've always thought when it comes to careers is that there's a lot of people that are kind of being the same. And you know, you all are very unique. And you all have your own personalities, you all have your own stories, you all have sort of the things that make you you. And you gotta share those things, right? Those are the things that if I'm trying to hire you someday, I wanna know what makes you stand out. You know, what's your personality like? But in addition to being unique, it's being kind. You know, if I go through, and if, let's be honest, most people are gonna search for you someday. They're gonna look at what you've done online because it stays there for so long. I call that the forever memory of digital. And so if I search for your stuff, is it gonna be good? Is it gonna be kind? Or are you gonna be ranting and swearing and being kind of a negative person? Because if I wanna work with you and hire you, I don't, I don't necessarily want that to be the presence that I'm seeing online. And plus, you know, if you're kind of negative, it's going to just sort of, you know, it's going to bleed into everything else that you're doing. Your networks matter. How many of you are on LinkedIn? I see, yeah. Well, some hands didn't go up. That's okay. We've got to get you all on LinkedIn. Those networks matter. Those professional networks matter. I'll tell you a story later on how I use Twitter and LinkedIn to basically figure out how to do what I do for a living in a different country. And it's because of those networks. The other thing is it's always evolving. You know, if you use Twitter and LinkedIn today or use social media today for job stuff, it could always change. You never want to fall in love with the tools, right? The tools can always change. It's what you do with them, either from a creative standpoint, media making standpoint, writing standpoint, that kind of thing. The second one's probably the most important. Context. Context perception. If you tweet something out, let's say it's this sort of group of four or five or six of you right here. We got a cool joke, we got some story <coughs> while sharing. It's, it makes sense to us, right? And so we post it in 140 characters on Twitter or we post it somewhere else. It's a shared joke, but we know the context of the joke. We know why it's funny, but we're not telling them the why it's funny. We're just sharing the funny stuff to us. <laughs> and it really upsets this group over here because they don't know why you're laughing. They don't know the context, right? The context matters so much. Like that sombrero picture of me. It was a birthday party, I was of age, what was the big deal? That shot tasted terrible, by the way. <laughs> so context matters. Context matters so much in terms of what photos you share, what you post, what you say, and how it can be interpreted. Um, I've had people literally make fun of me when I was speaking, who were my friends, you know, kind of like being snarky and the kind of way friends make fun of each other. I'm on stage, one group of friends making fun of me on social media, and there's like a wall showing tweets at an event. And so I've got friends of mine over here making fun of me. And I've got friends of mine over here that don't know that these people are my friends. And so they start fighting in public on a, on a Twitter wall of tweets. Right? Because they just didn't have the context, they didn't have the full story. So they were perceiving that I was getting attacked by a group of strangers when in fact, they were just making fun of me, which is, you know, obvious, probably an okay thing, especially with my friends. So, I don't know why we forget this over and over again. Digital never forgets. You know, you can erase your social media stuff, you can get rid of it, but man, I gotta tell you, once you post something, the odds of it getting shared, the odds of it being seen are so high. Uh, how many of you have done a screenshot on Snapchat? Wow, seriously. Look at this, how many hands showed up? That was ridiculous. How many of you haven't ever done a screenshot? On They're just lying. They're just lying. She works for Enterprise. She's taking Snapchat, Snapchat screenshots, which is really kind of a tongue twister, all the time. Anybody using Periscope? You heard of Periscope? You don't use it? It's okay. Periscope is kind of cool. You can live stream video. 
and it connects to Twitter, and it can be a social stream. So, for example, one day I was walking near Trafalgar Square in London, and I used Periscope, but I was just walking and talking, sort of showing uh, this, this really historical area to people who wanted to see. And so they could watch this live feed video, and they could comment, and they could hear me talking and whatnot. Uh, and so Periscope's really cool. It's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, if you're into media or communications or PR, it's definitely going to be something that's right up your alley. But a lot of people are using it just in general, right? And the other day, there was this lady who decided that she was going to live stream herself on Periscope while driving drunk. Yeah, she's slurring her words, and I'm not going to play the whole thing. But it's really, it's kind of sad, actually. And, and the people who were commenting here, they were like, hey, I'm going to call the police. What are you doing? Like, slow down, stop doing this. She gets pulled over by the cops. She gets a DUI, and the cops say, and the AP has it on their video if you want to look at this later, they say, you know, why aren't you periscoping this? The cops said that to her, which I thought was like, wow, well, it's like adding insult to injury, but you know. <laughs> this is uh, such a story of, you know, why would you ever, one, drive drunk, because it's not safe, not a good idea, but two, why would you ever broadcast it to a potential global audience? And you know how these things go, you know, it's sort of like you all start watching it, you tell your friends, they start watching it, and all of a sudden, it's not going to be so good for her, because I guarantee you, when you Google her name, when you Google her name, this is going to come up for the rest of her life. She's always going to be known as that person who drove drunk and periscoped it, slurring her words and all this stuff. It's ludicrous, right? Because Google, Google never forgets. How many of you have Googled your name? Yeah, she's smiling. She's like, oh, I Googled it, yeah. When you Google your name, what comes up? Anything good? Anything interesting? Nothing. She's like, zip. No. Doesn't work in my life. No. No? Nothing comes up? That's good. What about? This is it for me with my friend from home. She actually um, just applied for a job. She Googled her name first. And the first picture that showed up was her drinking a beer with a hat. And she, so she had to contact Google to try and see if she could get it down. I don't know if she ended up getting it down. She got the jobs when we looked it up, but... Man. Yeah, pretty rough. That's like the worst case example. I mean, note to self. Probably not going to want to wear that hat and, and have people taking your photo and then have it go on the web. There's 11 guys in the U.S. named Eric Stoller. 11. You'd think my name would be more unique than that, but apparently it's not. Two of them are attorneys. I think one guy lives in Ohio, one guy lives in New York State. I get emails from these guys all the time. Like at one point, I think his grandmother was emailing me like every other day, and I kept telling her, I don't want to know about this, please stop emailing me. But when you get Google, how many of you have a, have a name that's really common? Like you Google your name and there's like five people, or there's a celebrity that has a similar name, and you're like, I wish I could just like take them out of the picture. The cool thing with social and social media sites and apps and channels is you can basically dictate what comes up when you Google your name. If you buy yourname.com, for example, I bought ericstoller.com long, long time ago, it comes up number one every time. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but if you buy yourname.com, it's like the number one way to ensure that when your name gets Googled by someone, your stuff's gonna come up in the, at the beginning of that search result. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. And in the beginning of that web, with that webpage, you can put things like your resume, things of what you're doing, your interests, etc. Probably not gonna wanna put a photo of you wearing the select cap while drinking, <laughs> just the thought. If you're on Twitter, if you're on LinkedIn, these websites will help you build your sort of presence when it comes to being searched because most employers are searching for people these days. This is sort of like Search Engine 101, but how many of you already own yourname.com? Nobody. Oh, you gotta get out there. That's like so easy to do, right? It's like the number one thing you can do is buy your name. <clears throat> now, if your name's really common, like let's say your name is John Smith, 
which my apologies because it means you have really uncreative parents. <laughs> it's probably true. But if your name is something very similar, use your middle initial, maybe use your entire middle name. But make sure that when someone gets your resume or someone gets your profile, your information, that when they look you up later, they can find your stuff. And again, if, get on LinkedIn, get on Twitter, buyyourname.com. These are simple things that you can do. Now, I'm a huge fan of Twitter. I saw this in the stairwell of a startup in the Bay Area. I just thought it was pretty funny because they were all like wearing chambray and being all startup y. And they probably would have thought about tweeting about something before they exited the building. But I love searching for what people say on Twitter. It used to be that, that Twitter would only let you search like a certain sort of period of time. Like you couldn't go back all the way to the beginning of time on Twitter. Because Twitter started, what year did Twitter start? 2007. What? 2006. 2006. Yeah, 2006. So it's been out for quite a while. I joined Twitter in 2007. After it had been out for a year, there were already like a million users. So it's been going for quite some time. You ever search for stuff on Twitter? And by the way, Twitter right now, when you sort of think about careers and jobs, and, and when is graduation? May. May, right? Like what can you do now, today, tomorrow, et cetera, until May, to help with this whole job search thing? Two things, get on Twitter and get on LinkedIn especially. And those things might change at some point. Now, Twitter may go away. LinkedIn may even go away. But get on Twitter for networking for all kinds of reasons. But I love searching on Twitter for what people are saying. For example, this guy Ryan tweeted out, what a disgrace, there's a woman crying at the Ryanair, that's an airline. She's at the check-in desk who's been made to pay more for emotional baggage. You thought that was real? Hi Ryan, which airport is this happening at? So Ryanair, the airline, they tweeted at her, as if, or tweeted at Ryan as if this was real. You get the joke? No? So it's not real baggage, it's just like her emotion. It's okay. It's, can we get some more caffeine? I mean, I mean seriously, okay. It's what what time is it right now? It's 1.30? My body thinks it's 6.30, okay? 6.30, I'm getting ready for dinner in my, in my mind. Physically, I'm here. Let's see, my friend Marcus tweeted this out. I thought this was pretty good. Students never get my emails. Today I sent an email about free tickets to the football game on ESPN. Miraculously, they all got it. People always tell me that students don't check email. The students are terrible with email. Have you heard that? Like professors, faculty, staff, maybe other students. How many of you would say you're terrible at email? Yeah, you're terrible at email. I like your honesty. It's good. Email is sort of the professional communications currency of the real world. You know, email might be terrible now because guess what? Let me let me sort of give you some insider knowledge. How many of you get paid to check email? I'm looking in the back there. There's a few people in this room, myself included, we get paid to check email. Right? Can you get that real job? A huge percentage of the time you spend doing that real job is communicating with other professionals through email. And you get paid to do it as part of the job. When you're a student, it's really easy to be bad at email because you've got all these other commitments and all these other things going on, and no one's giving you a check, right, to check email. So just know this, email down the road is going to be really important, really, really important. Or this from Stats Canada, 100% of Canadians will retweet this. Nice. Thank you for those like, you know, like, it gets there, it's like a slow sort of <laughs> the, the laughs start coming. I read this, the first time I read this one, I was like, wait a minute. Oh, okay, I read it. it. Took me a second. Or this one. You would think the chicken curry at Curry College would be good. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. I mean, you just think it would be, anybody know this guy? No. No? 
okay, maybe we're just here for a visit. <laughs> Someone's gonna have to tweet it, Matthew. I don't, anyone give it a shot? Yeah. There's one vowel in that last name. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's okay, I was in Wales a couple weeks ago in Cardiff, and they, they still speak Welsh. Welsh is spoken and written in, in Wales. Literally no, no vowels anywhere. I don't know. I don't know how it works. But, you know, when you think about this, this tweet here, this is going to be on Twitter for as long as possible, unless maybe he deletes it. You know, I do all these searches for what people say about places. And I love to search for what people say about <coughs> stuff, and then in, insert like words like love, and hate, and swear words. And then you get to see what really people really think about stuff. And it's really fascinating to me when I think about this is what you're putting out there. And it reflects who you are now. And it can reflect who you are to people who see you in the future. So what you say matters. For example, I used this tweet the very first time I came to Curry College uh, that I'm going to show you next, this, this one that's coming up. Uh, I'm not sure if this person's in the room. They might even be a senior now. Uh, so I actually I blocked out their name this time. So hopefully if they're here, I, I apologize uh, for mild embarrassment. Um, but they, they said, as you, you can probably fill in the blanks, they said, thank you, Curry College, just pulling weeds out of your garden. And that's, that's how I interpreted it at the time. Yeah. Do you believe that? All right, we'll keep going. I know, I know. And then, I really used to hate Curry College, but now I couldn't picture myself anywhere else. <laughs> that's nice. That's nice, right? Sort of like, that's a dog. That was in 2013. Don't take pictures if it's your friend. That's just terrible. <laughs> my friend, no, my friend, no, my friend, no, my friend. Okay. Oh, you're friends with these people. Okay. I'm honestly dreading the day that I have to go back to Curry. Man, why? Why? You know, I think part of it is we all have good days and bad days, right? Some of you are like, I know these people, I know these avatars. But we all have good days and bad days, and I think. Part of a, a healthy, kind, unique digital identity that is going to still allow you to be yourself, but not actually get you in trouble when it comes to how people perceive you, is, you know, those moments when you're really upset, it's always best to not go online or best to pull out your phone and just type some stuff out and post it. Because people post stuff when they're really upset. Like, for example, how many of you, you sleep next to your phones? Right? You sleep next to your phone, you got it plugged in maybe next to you. And then, how many of you check your phone when you're laying like this? You know? And then, and then you have to like look at it with one eye, because it's so bright. And you angle the phone up a little bit so it doesn't blind you directly. And then, and then you're, you're, depending on if you're like right-handed or left-handed and which side of the bed you're on, you get it. Like auto rotate, like it's always doing that thing, and you have to like flick it around. <laughs> and then, and then you get people who post stuff, right? They're they're posting stuff in the sideways position. They got one eye open in the dark, and maybe it's not the stuff that they should be posting, you know, because they're not thinking clearly, because they got one eye open in the dark on their side. Worst ones. I mean, I, I just tried to tone it down. <coughs> I get it, right? We have bad days. But I'm just some dude who came from Iowa through London, lived all over the place, and I had to try this stuff. And honestly, if I'm hiring people in this day and age, I want to see what they're sharing, what they're posting. I do appreciate all caps, though. <laughs> It's sort of representative of a personal brand, though, when you think about it, right? Because in a sense, in this day and age, we're all sort of the embodiment of our own brand, right? 
When you post something online, when you're sharing stuff, when you're writing stuff, when you're creating media, it, it's representative of the kind of stuff you want to share with the world. How many of you think about your personal brand from time to time? Yeah, any business majors, any comms majors? Yeah. But you know, even if you're not a business major or a comms major or some of the majors that maybe get into communication stuff a little bit more, it's important to think about the you that you present to the world. Like this one. I hate listening to career services tell me how to differentiate myself at the career fair because half of it is a sack of, well, I mean, I'm from Iowa originally, just like this person, so maybe it's like a sack of community. You know, a lot of agriculture, a lot of animals and livestock. Like, why would, you know, one of the things I'm always sort of really fascinated with when it comes to college students is career services, their one goal in life is to help you get a job later on when you leave your institution. Right? I would be bothering them and like pestering them and connecting with them like to the point where they were telling me to go away. Like they'd be like, get out of our office, we've seen you enough. Right? And I know when you're a student, you've got all this stuff going on, right? How many of you have a paper due tomorrow? Well, see, that's what happens when you fly time. Monday. Monday. When you're, you know, when you're so when you're a consultant, here's a little insight sort of tip when you're a consultant, if you ever become a consultant, every day is Wednesday. Because really, in your world, you work in every day anyway, right? I'm speaking at a conference on Saturday, flying on Sunday, so every day is kind of like a Wednesday in a, in a sense. And then this one, WTF, we were required to have an exit interview with our career services advisor before picking up our cap and gown. Man. It's rough. You gotta meet with career services, right? Why wouldn't you? How many of you have had scheduled a one-on-one -on -one with career services? Nice. Sort of preaching to the choir a little bit because you're the ones that showed up. I noticed there was a lot of name badges out there that didn't show up. I'm glad you all came. I do appreciate the emoticon though. <laughs> It's what's, you know, what's interesting is when you see the time stamp on a lot of this stuff, right? People are posting at like 9 o'clock at night, you know? It's been a long day. <coughs> so I'm going to ask you this question. And I think I have met amazing student leaders at campuses, right? I've met like people who are phenomenal on their campus in person. Like they're, they're doing great work. They're, they're in student government. They're leading student organizations. They're, you know, making the grade, etc. But the, then online is that they're a different person. And I think it used to be, like when I went to college, it was like one phone, like a pay phone, right, in the hallway. So if I wanted to do something kind of stupid and share it with everybody, I'd have to actually like find a quarter and like do a pay phone thing. And like, just weren't gonna do that, right? You couldn't be bothered to do that. It would take way too much time. And now it's like, you could be this amazing student leader, but then you could go on to Snapchat and you could share something, and your friends take a screenshot of it, and the next thing you know, it's me share all over the place. And it doesn't really reflect who you are as a person. You just maybe had a moment where you're upset, or you know, it was like Friday night or something. So being a leader in all spaces matters. <laughs> Especially when, how many of you in this room know that you're going to be competing with one another? <laughs> right? Like, that's a big deal. And whatever it can give you the edge when you graduate is important. It's super important. I tweeted this out about a year and change ago. <laughs> Social media amplifies whatever it is you're saying, right? Because let's say this is a conversation right here. We're having a conversation. There's like, what do you think? Maybe 70, 60, 70 of you and one of me. That's it, right? If we didn't have our phones out, if we didn't have the media over here doing their thing with the cameras and stuff, we wouldn't have any recording of all this. It'd be totally fine. But social media amplifies your stuff, right? One tweet, and then all of a sudden you're on the news. You know, like you're periscoping yourself. Well, granted, in that lady's case, she shouldn't have been drinking and driving anyway, but she also chose to broadcast it to people. And so I think it's important to realize that what you say online, 
even at sort of, how many students at Curry College? Good question. How many? Doesn't know? That's okay. Roughly 2,000. 2,000 ish. You know, kind of a small community, right? So you all ever get in fights? Is there ever any disagreements? Is there any drama? Is there any drama at Curry? Right? I went, to, I went to a community college for my first two years, and it was about 2,000 people who lived on campus. There was so much drama. And so, you know, you have a little bit of drama sometimes when you got about 2,000 people. And so you kind of maybe, you know, there's some stuff going back and forth on social, but that stuff that goes back and forth on social can be seen by the rest of us, right? It doesn't just exist in the bubble that is current. So I want to get into this sort of section of why, oh why, would people hire you? Have you ever thought about this? Like why people would hire you? It's not just because you have a degree, right? Because <coughs> a lot of people are going to have a degree. It's like why would people hire you? One of the things that I think gets lost in the shuffle a lot of times is this need to hustle. This need to sort of invest energy into the job search, invest energy into the establishment of your digital identity as something to help you with your career development. My driver today, who drove me from Boston over to Curry, she's originally from Ukraine. Now she lives in the States. And she told me that she's literally like one internship away from getting her college degree. And I said, well, first thing, you gotta get that degree. And then I said, you know, have you thought about getting on LinkedIn? She said, no, I haven't thought about it. A lot of people have told me, though, that I should get on LinkedIn. If you don't do something, if you just think about it, it's not as powerful, right? You've got to hustle. You've got to want it. You've got to work at it. And I know when you're a student, being a student is like your full-time job. And, and you sort of, you know, whenever you have a job, even if you're a student or if you have a job that's sort of, you know, a paid job, you sort of fill in your schedule with fun stuff, work stuff, school stuff. And this career stuff kind of gets slotted into another space, like extra. But you gotta work hard at this, and the harder you work at it now, the easier it's gonna be come May. Very easily. And I wanted to share uh, this idea, this concept. Let me pop this up here. This comes from a professor in the UK. In the UK, they're very hierarchical, they're very much like work life, sort of are separate, you know, I don't want to do social media if it's going to be personal, or I don't want to do social media if it's just professional. And it blurs personal and professional. Your social presence, whether you like it or not, is this sort of holistic version of you. Right? Unless you've got it all on lockdown. How many of you have it all like just privacy and like lockdown, etc.? Some of you? Yeah. But those of you that have it on lockdown, do you have many friends? And just saying, those friends have the same screenshot ability as this lady who works for Enterprise, who we know loves to get on Snapchat and take screenshots. I'm going to pick on her and make stories up. But, but the bottom line is this, if you have your social lockdown, there's a good chance sometimes your stuff's going to be out there because your friends can still, sit, still take screenshots, etc. So there's no longer personal, professional, and they're split. All connected. Like I still, I tweet about ridiculous stuff. You know, I tweet too much about coffee. I post too much about you know the fact that I'm totally geeking out for the Star Wars movie that's coming out in December. Why? Because I'm old, right? Because if you were born a long time ago, Star Wars was cool back then, and now it's going to be cool again, so it's kind of nerdy. I'm excited about this. Some of you, though, you know, you're not going to get a job necessarily wearing this. You know, some of you might get paid to wear sneakers for a living. Some of you might get paid to, you know, be more casual or be more creative in terms of, like, the arts or movie making or films, that type of thing. So just know that the context of your career matters as well. Right, because you might hear about people who get a job because they post ridiculous stuff, but that fits with the kind of job that they want. Anybody look at Casey Neistat? Anybody ever heard about this guy? When he was like 16 or 17, 
he moved to New York City and was like a dishwasher for a while. But he wanted to make films. And so he started making films with like a really crappy film camera. And eventually he started making better ones. And then he made a couple of viral videos in New York City that just sort of like made his career just go crazy awesome in terms of like Nike hired him. Uh, I think J. Crew hired him. Uh, Mercedes Benz has hired him. And now he does like this daily vlog. He's got ridiculously curly hair. He's got this crazy studio in New York City. He skateboards everywhere. But his career fits with who he is as a person. And he sort of made this niche that fits him. And he gets to be himself. And so when it comes to what you post on social, if you want to have a career that maybe isn't as conventional or isn't as traditional, that's totally cool. But just remember, that might be the career that you're going to be stuck in for a little while, because people aren't going to necessarily want to hire someone who isn't as conventional. For example, um, Casey here, he actually has this startup <coughs> in this app called Beam. Anybody heard about Beam? Yeah, it's like so cutting edge, apparently. Beam lets you shoot videos by essentially using the sensor on your phone. You put it up to like your chest, or you just cover it up um, with your hand. And there's no like editing, there's no sort of reviewing it ahead of time. It's just like really quick snippets of video. And when they first released it, there was this guy who's out there on Twitter masquerading as if uh, they were customer service for this app called Beam. They were answering questions, they were acting like they worked for Beam. And so eventually, they said, hey, you're not working for us, but you should. And so they hired this person. I thought, what an interesting, unconventional way to get a job. Here's another way that's kind of unconventional to get a job. That's an interesting way to do it. <laughs> interesting way to do it. I mean, the first thing when I saw this video is I thought, man, I'm exhausted, first and foremost, and she's got some serious dance skills. <laughs> and someone tweeted at her and they said, hey, just seen your video, greatest thing, greatest thing ever, what was your boss's response? I accept your resignation. Makes sense. There are people in career services, and almost rightly so, who say, it's not the best way to quit a job. Probably not the best way to get a job. But this video that she made, it went viral. It was seen by millions and millions and millions of people. It was like the best sort of job clip she could have hoped for. And now, she works for Comedy Central. Oh. <laughs> she turned down a job from Yahoo. Yahoo was like, we want to hire you. She's like, nah, that's cool. I don't want Yahoo. <laughs> So again, the context of the career that you want to have really does matter when it comes to your digital identity. I love that. You know, what is your number one career goal as a writer? Health insurance? <laughs> Think about the context of my own work. My job, I made up my job back in October of 2010. I quit the most high-paying job 
one of the coolest jobs actually I've ever had in my whole life. I was working at Oregon State University. I was doing all kinds of good stuff there. And I decided I wanted to do something different. And I wanted to get paid to write, speak, and consult for institutions, to work with students, to work with staff and faculty. And so my work day, my work day is totally built around my digital identity. My wife is always like, why are you on Twitter so much? I'm like, yeah, but Twitter's what I do for a living, in a way. Right? I, I'm posting, I'm sharing, I'm engaging. I'm sharing little anecdotes about my parents. Like my mom, you know, so it's funny that my dad accesses Facebook using my mom's account. My mom never comments or likes stuff. Instead, she'll send me a text as her comment. Like, really, mom? Now, when my wife, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, said, hey, you want to move to London? I've got this really cool job opportunity. And I said, sure, let's go to London. That's awesome. The currency is like valued as twice as much. So whatever I earn in the US is going to be worth half as much. I don't know anybody. That's cool. I have no network at all. I'm going to have to work twice as hard for half as much money uh, in a country that's trying to kick me out because I don't have a visa. <laughs> let's, let's make this happen. <laughs> So what did I do? I started connecting with every LinkedIn group I could get my hands on when it came to higher education related stuff in, in the UK. I started connecting with people who were at ed tech, people that were at universities and colleges all over the UK. I started connecting and communicating with that audience. And by the time I got my visa and my ability to work, I had set up a lot of meetings that had sort of started off as just like tweets or little interactions on LinkedIn. And then I start, you know, in-person connections, coffee chats here and there. And now I'm getting gigs to speak in the UK, which is really convenient because I don't have to fly through Iceland. <laughs> because of Twitter and LinkedIn. If, if like, Twitter and LinkedIn hadn't existed, I would have had to go through, like, I don't know what kind of process to, like, literally go to conferences to meet people in person and use the phone and all this stuff that wouldn't have actually been as quick or as fast. If you're looking for a job in any industry, you can do it in such a way when it comes to finding it, connecting with the right people, using Twitter and LinkedIn. Because I guarantee you, regardless of your industry, there are people who are interesting that you need to talk to on those platforms. There are groups. How many of you are part of a LinkedIn group for the sole purpose of your career? Yeah, how many of you follow people on Twitter for the sole purpose of your career? Any of you ever tweeted at them? You ever tweet at those people? Yeah, a few of them. Yeah, tweet at them. What's the harm, right? Might as well connect with them. And LinkedIn, by the way, when you follow people, you connect to people on LinkedIn, you see that thing on the right-hand side that says like, hey, you follow this person, there's these other people you might want to connect with. I connected with a whole bunch of people on LinkedIn that way. People that I didn't even know, but I'd write up a little letter and say, hey, I, I, I came from the United States, I'm now in the UK, I do this, I do that. And slowly but surely, I've been able to build a career in the UK, literally having known no people whatsoever. Starting from scratch. So again, get on LinkedIn. Because I know some of you are on LinkedIn. They should teach LinkedIn like orientation, right? I know when you're a freshman, you're like, well, I don't have a job, I'm not looking for a job. But you should get in there and start building your profile, start building sort of the skills necessary to use it. Because LinkedIn has ridiculous amounts of data to be useful. This is my phone. I kind of edited some of the apps to make it look like it's a lot more cooler. Uh, but, not, I mean, but, but LinkedIn has these, some really good apps. Get the LinkedIn app. And then, how many of you have the LinkedIn Jobs app on your phone? Hands up high so I can really see them this time. Here, one, two. This number should be like every one of them. The LinkedIn Jobs app is like magic. It does one thing and it does it really well. All it does is helps you find jobs that are relevant to the bits of information that you fed into LinkedIn via your profile. So I'm in London and I'll pop open the LinkedIn Jobs app and it will literally show me jobs that are unbelievably tailored to my interests and career aspirations that are in London because of all the information that I've plugged into LinkedIn. You know, it's, it's like the quickest way for me to find stuff that's relevant. And you can even apply for jobs using the LinkedIn app, the job app. So definitely get that. How many of you are blogging on LinkedIn? How many of you are blogging, period? 
been sort of a lot of articles and news stories about blogs as being dead or blogs not being that cool anymore. But the people that hire in many capacities, they're still going to find your stuff through your blog. And LinkedIn's blog platform, they call it LinkedIn Publishing, whatever you post here has a really high chance of being seen by people who are interested in whatever it is you're posting about. LinkedIn's algorithm is, again, it's like magic. It'll take your blog post about whatever field you're interested in or whatever sort of area of work that you want to go into, and it will feed that algorithmically to people who are interested in it. And the more you write, the better, especially if you build your network. The, build, the bigger your network, the better your chances. And LinkedIn is just letting you do this. Because how many of you have a lot of endorsements? A few of you. These endorsements are really cool too because that helps, that data helps with getting you in front of employers. Employers are looking at this data. They want to see candidates who have a high number of endorsements in certain areas and LinkedIn gives them access to that data. Like apparently I have blogging skills. You know, some of these might not, like if like someone puts you down for like lawn care, you know, you might not want to. But, but again, it's all relevant. And the more of these you get, the better. This guy, John, used to work for LinkedIn, and he tweeted this three years ago. It's kind of amazing that it's still kind of relevant. If you're not on Twitter, that's probably okay. But if you're looking for a job, and you're in sort of that career development phase of your life, which, let's be honest, it's kind of going to be nonstop, like from now until maybe when you retire. Like career development just matters. It's going to be something you do throughout your life. And LinkedIn right now is the place to be for that. This statistic came out just like in the last week or so. That LinkedIn's the only major social media site where there are more users who are age 30 and 49 than 18 and 29. I think this stat should change, right? Like I hope this stat changes. Because how many of you in the room are in the 30 to 49 year old cohort? Yeah, and how many of those of you who raised your hands in that cohort already have a job? Yeah. You all are the future, right? You want to get the job, the J-O-B, right? If you Google your name right now and nothing comes up, you know what that means? You get to fill in all those blank spaces with whatever you want. Your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter account, your blog, etc. This stat should be flipped, right? It should be flipped so that most of you should be on there hunting, hustling, being eager. So I know I've got a couple more minutes here, 10 or so. I want to do Q&A. Now, I've got like an hour or so after this, <coughs> sort of more in-depth tactical, strategic stuff. Because I know hopefully some of you have questions, because I've got answers. But any questions that come to mind right now, the things you want to ask? Yes? Uh, what do you think is the biggest thing as like, a person going into the workforce? What do you think is, like, as an employer, uh, what do you think is the number one thing you look for when looking for new hires? <laughs> so if you couldn't hear the question, what's the number one thing that employers are looking for in a yeah. new hire? They get it? Okay. They're usually the sort of the basics. And the basics are, can you write coherently? You know, how many of you love to write in this room? And how many of you not so much? Okay. Some of you are in the not so much crowd. We've got to get you to a space where you don't think of writing as sort of like punishment or homework. Right? Writing is something that you use. It's sort of your entryway into so many jobs, into so many spaces. So, you know, employers will see your credential, right? It might be your credential that gets you in the door into the, the first pile of applicants, right? Because you've sort of gone through that first hurdle. But then, you know, what, what does your cover letter say about you? What does your resume say about you? And that's their first sort of, you know, foray into your writing ability. That's, all, that's the first thing, they, that's all they get, right? They don't, they don't have any conversation time with you, they don't see any body language, any personal skills, it's all about your writing. So writing's number one. How many of you love public speaking? Okay, how many of you don't like public speaking? Right? Why don't you like public speaking? The 
shout it out. Why not? I'm more nervous. nervous. What? Nerves. Nerves. Get nerves. Yeah, this. You shook your hands, right? Mm -hmm. And why do you shake your hands? Adrenaline, right? Adrenaline. I gotta tell you, when you're jet lagged, <laughs> adrenaline feels good. <laughs> but here's the cool thing, right? You just gotta take that nerve, that adrenaline, and be smart about it, right? So I would say writing and public speaking are the two things that come to mind, top of mind easiest. Because in a world where everybody's got a credential, what makes you stand out? Well, the first handshake digitally is usually going to be your writing. And then when you do public speaking, if you have to present to a group, here's, here's a real sort of bit of insight, by the way. I've given talks to rooms full of like 1,200, 1,500 people. You feel like a rock star in that situation. You know, sometimes they're even filming you and bro they're like broadcasting you onto a big screen. And there's like a 20 foot version of you right next to you in HD. And you can't even see the crowd because you're all like spotlit. So you look out and it's just vast like array of darkness with little glowing things every once in a while, right? Because it's everybody's phone. How many of you that just the, the thought of that makes you a little nervous? But here's the thing. The first time I did that, I was like shaking. Like I was vibrating, like my whole body was shaking practically. Because I had pumped so much adrenaline into myself. And I realized, you know what? Why wouldn't I be a little nervous? Why wouldn't I have a little anxiety? Why wouldn't I have some nerves? Right? I think that the sort of thinking when it comes to public speaking that you're going to battle through the nerves, don't try to battle the nerves. Just realize that they're there, and then don't hold on to things and let people know you have adrenaline or nerves. Right? You did the handshake thing. <laughs> when people do notes, notes give you away. Right? If you're holding a note card and it's like fluttering like a, like a butterfly, well, they know that you're nervous, right? It's like your hand's moving. But guess what? If you don't have notes, and you have nothing in your hand, and no one's like watching you holding your hands, right? You could just be a hand talker. Then you can sort of flap around like you're a human butterfly, but no one really knows you might be a little nervous or whatever. And so that, that's a huge thing when it comes to public speaking. When it comes to writing, I would encourage all of you to write maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, about something that you actually love, something that you're actually passionate about. Because how many of you right now at this stage in your academic career are in a major that maybe you wouldn't have chosen had you a do-over. Yeah, let's be honest. I did communication and PR, and I did marketing for my undergrad. And for grad school, for my master's degree, I went into higher education administration. It's a uh, master's degree in education. If I had a do-over, if I go back in time, I might do philosophy or sociology or something else. <coughs> but you know what? I write about the stuff that I'm interested in. I'm interested in technology, I'm interested in education, so I write about the stuff that makes me happy. And so, when employers are looking for you online, they're really looking for who you are, what you share, and how you present yourself, not just face-to-face, -face, but online as well. Other questions? Yeah. So, I'm working with a startup company right now, and one of our goals is something we're always asking how we can make our social media presence stronger. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to someone who's looking to their social media presence? Yeah, so how do you make your social media presence stronger? One is you've got to do a lot of listening on social media. You ever use TweetDeck or Hootsuite, any of the like, social media dashboards? I have a, at home, I have a Thunderbolt display, right? It's a massive display. It's on my desk, and I use uh, TweetDeck to have columns and columns and columns of searches that I've looked for to sort of see who's out there, see what people are saying. When I got all these tweets, when I pulled all these tweets from Curry College, that's how I did to find out what's going on. And so if you're in a startup area, or even if you just want to connect with people who are doing stuff that you're interested in, especially connected to your career stuff, use the, using like TweetDeck or even just Twitter.com to search. Searching for them and finding them and then following them and then connecting to them and saying, hey, we're out here, we exist. You know, maybe you go to one of their tweets and you sort of look at what they said and you sort of piggyback on that as a response. I think the biggest thing people forget when it comes to using social tactically for communications is it's about the conversation. The most important thing with social is the conversation aspect. If you're just pushing stuff out all the time, it's not going to be as important. Yeah? I always like retweet like funny like memes or parody accounts or vines because I just have like a really good sense of humor. No. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being funny, right? So she said, I like to post memes, <coughs> vines, um, you know, funny stuff. <coughs> Parody, satire. 
Nothing wrong with being funny. I think where some people kind of skirt the edge is when they get a little bit too snarky in a negative sense when it feels like it could be uh, distasteful or hurting other people. Um, you know that the Irma Gerd, like the one with the girl with like the pigtails and like the smile? That's like, a, that's like ancient meme history, right? You gotta know your meme history. I read an article today about her, right? She's an actual human being. And she's, I can't remember how old she is now, but she's like, all their friends are always asking her about this meme. And it's just ridiculous to me, you know, like, it's like she's like 25, 30 years old now, and this meme just continues. So there's nothing wrong with memes, there's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff. You want to be funny? Go ahead and be funny, right? Be sarcastic, be silly, there's nothing wrong with that. I think one of the things, though, is just be consistent. You know, I think if you're a certain way online, and then you deviate from that and become a, a different way, and, and it just seems like it's like people are like, what, who is this person now? This doesn't seem like her. You know, that, that really matters. Like on, on Twitter, for example, I've always had a, bit, a little bit of attitude, a bit a little funny, uh, but I share lots of stuff too. I curate lots of articles for the community, like the higher education. The vines are great, six seconds, good times. <laughs> Any other questions? It's hard to come up with a question on the spot. Yeah. Um, you said you said which good jobs to look for, you know, in the writing and different things like that. Um, and with everyone coming out of college, everyone will have the same degree. Um, so what do you think separates those people as they get further along in the process? You know, what separates person who gets to the second or the third or even the fourth or third is one interview from the person who just submits an application or something. I think the, the people that are most comfortable with themselves, if you're self-aware, I think self-awareness is a big part of it. Um, in a world where everybody comes out sort of very similar and, and you know, you think about like what's the uniform for guys, right, when we're interviewing, right? It's, it's like suit and tie, jacket, you know, it's like we could all come out of like a factory stamp, you know, looking the same. So it's like, what is it that makes you, you? What makes, you know, it's your personality, right? It's your smile. It's the stuff that, you know, when you go into that interview, you might get nervous and you might kind of shut some of that stuff off. But people want to hire you because of who you are and what you can do. And so I always say, like, be yourself. Like, you know what? I'm very opinionated. I'm very opinionated. And, and I share those opinions. I write about the things that I'm opinionated about, uh, about, and I sort of stand behind those things. And I think that that's really important, right? Especially in a space where a lot of people are saying the same thing. You know, you, you can still be nice and be kind. It's just like, what, what makes you you? That's really important. And I know that sounds so cliche and so contrived, but it is, at the end of the day, my career success, you know, I started working my first professional job uh, in, in higher education anyway, it was back in 2002 at the University of Illinois Chicago. And so I've got like 13 plus years now of higher education work. And I found, no joke, that the more I am myself, the more I just sort of relax and, and be myself, the, the better my career has gone. The more invitations to do work, uh, the more opportunities that have come my way. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very free in that sense. Because you, you, know, you stop sort of being, uh, you know, professionalism is one of those things that could be very rigid and constricted, or you could say, I'm a professional, but I'm a professional in my own way. Yeah. So we've been talking about how like social media and the you off of it and then the you on it. Mm -hmm. As somebody who would be an employer, which one's more important? The social media you, like when you're on social media, or the you that they meet when you're going to bed? Both. Yeah, they're equal. So she asked, I don't know if you can hear it, she asked, what's more important, the you on social media or the you face to face? And I think generationally it used to be you could sort of be one way online and one way offline and it didn't, they didn't connect as much. But now with people looking at your profiles, with people looking at your stuff, they want it to align, right? They want it to connect. And that's really important. You know, are you congruent? Because right, the real world is happening online, right? You would say that what happens online matters just as much, right? There's a lot of emotion and story and drama online. It matters just as much as offline and stuff. One more question. Well, um, just to be clear, like devil's advocate, yeah. what if someone like, how do you know if 
how do you separate the professional person and someone having an outlet to be opinionated? Because then there's a whole thing of speech thing, like, aren't you allowed to voice your opinions or whatever? How are you ever going to have that privacy? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for advocating for the devil. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, you get to say some awkward things. <laughs> I, I think that, one, if you're in a profession that feels like you, it's constricting and you can't be who you want to be, you know, I would say, can you find a job that lets you be yourself, first and foremost? Uh, and yes, there is that performative aspect, right? There's a performance aspect when it comes to social media, right? There's this sense of like, like when you take a picture and you Instagram it, do you make sure it looks good? Like when you take a selfie, right? How, do you like take one, one selfie or do you like take a few to make sure you get the right one? Right, there's this performance aspect of it. And so, if you're feeling like the stuff you're saying, you can't say it because you're a job, maybe that's not a good job. Then, you know, if what you're saying, though, if other people start judging you and saying maybe you shouldn't be saying this, I'd have some really heavy, thoughtful conversations around what is it that I'm saying that is upsetting people? And is there a different way for me to share it? Is there a different outlet for me to share it? Uh, and then sometimes maybe you think, maybe I shouldn't share this stuff, because guess what? The world's not ready for this. And that's why sometimes the people do post things anonymously, or they do post things under uh, you know, a different name. But nine times out of ten, if they post something that's really inflammatory or really controversial or to get them in trouble like from a you know, freedom of speech type thing, people are going to track you down, right? They're going to find out who it is. I've got two tweets I had to share with you uh, before I wrap this up. I just thought they were nice, kind of warm, fuzzy tweets. This is from Amanda. If I don't get accepted to Cary College, she's going to cry because it'll be a reminder of how much of an endless void of emptiness my life is. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope she got in. I mean, yeah, can we just check? I don't know. I hope she got in. She's <laughs> really in. What's that? <laughs> it's a big deal, right? You know, though. This could be when I took the screenshot, it could have been like London time. So just to, you know, just to start like right now, like a week later, so. I know. Yeah. <laughs> or this one, Prairie College is absolutely adorable and it has such a homey feel. And I gotta say, I agree. So, yeah, thank you very much.